So, um, Martin Atkins, Reverend Dr. Martin Atkins, almost needs no introduction. He's such a well-loved figure around this college um, and such a familiar face. But he, has, he does have the most remarkable career behind him. 1996 was when he first came to this college uh, as the um, uh, postgraduate tutor of evangelism, mission, and renewal studies. Within a decade, he'd become the principal and was the principal for four, for four years and became president of the Methodist Conference, general secretary of the Methodist Church and secretary of the conference. And then uh, in 2015, of course, he took up his post uh, Methodist uh, Central Hall in Westminster uh, and has since then been pastoring in Florida as well. So a remarkable and glittering career, a speaker who is in demand around the world and is actually also a very nice man. Uh, <laughs> please welcome uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Atkins. Thank you, Ben. You can have two free books. <laughs> yes, I don't reckon that. I, I, I say this quite often, but when anybody gives you a kind of big build-up like that, I remember a time that I was years and years and years ago going to this tiny chapel to a, a chapel anniversary, and uh, outside it said, the preacher this morning is Reverend Martin Atkins, dash, we couldn't get a better preacher. <laughs> I thought, that's a... <laughs> And I thought, well, that's, that's about the mark of it, really. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, good morning, everyone, both here in the college. There's some people here. And I understand we've got quite a number of people, Ben, on, on, who have joined the Zoom online. So good morning to you all. Uh, the marks of Methodism mission potency for today. Uh, what John Wesley called the marks of a true Methodist are contained in his early tract called The Character of a Methodist, first published in 1742. It was a response to some of the criticisms being levied at Wesley and a fast emerging Wesleyan movement, and also an opportunity to state what Methodist Christians were like, their principles and practices. So the early paragraphs seek to explain what a Methodist is not and the later paragraphs try to explain what a Methodist is, the things that mark them out and articulate their character. Both the title and content of this short early pamphlet are revealing and intriguing. Wesley loved the Beatitudes of Jesus and he preached them often. And like the Beatitudes, this tract focuses more on character what a person is like and how they act, than primarily, notice that word, primarily what they believe. The body of his tract begins like this. The distinguishing marks of a Methodist are not his opinions of any sort, his assenting to this or that scheme of religion, his embracing any particular set of notions. As to all opinions that do not strike at the root of Christianity, we think and let think. Now, uh, just uh, an aside, opinions at this time included and signified beliefs or convictions, and as you can already hear, like all works of this period, male language is used, often though not always, to assume linguistically the inclusion of both men and women. Now, it's important to make clear that Wesley is not saying beliefs are unimportant. Rather, he is saying that the character of a person arising from the convictions that they hold is the acid test. In that same opening paragraph, for instance, he states, quote, we believe indeed that all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. We believe the written word of God to be the only and sufficient rule both of Christian faith and practice. We believe Christ to be the eternal supreme God. In short, John Wesley is at pains to assert that Methodists are believers in what he calls plain old Christianity. That they're not sectarian or unorthodox as is being claimed of them by some. It's equally important to note that the focus here is not 
doctrine presented as either divisive or decisive, as in fact so many documents seeking to describe one Christian grouping over or against another have been and sadly still are. Instead, the focus in paragraph after paragraph is on the character of the Methodist Christian person, one who is, and I quote again, happy, full of love, prayerful, pure in heart, servant-minded, and known by their fruit. One who rejoices in God, one whose intentions at all times and in all things is not to please himself, but him who his soul loveth, whose desire is to do the will of God on earth as it is done on heaven, and whose heart is full of love towards all humankind, who goes, does good to all, in short, who does everything to the glory of God. By salvation, he concludes, I mean holiness of heart and life. However, in spite of Wesley's assertion that Methodists do not, as he puts it, affect to use any particular expressions of scripture more frequently than others, unless they are as such more frequently used by the inspired writers themselves, it's undoubtedly the case that Methodism, like all other Christian groupings and traditions, has over time developed certain emphases in terms of doctrine and principles and practices and traditions, certain themes and tones that are particularly precious and meaningful to us. Which leads to a central theme of this lecture this morning, namely that I regard the themes and tones found in the character of a Methodist and many other places in Wesley's writing to have produced not just the marks of a true Methodist, but also, crucially and over time, some lasting marks on the people called Methodists. In other words, marks of Methodism itself. Our special emphases, our convictions, our moods and tones in which we at our best articulate them, even down to today. Rupert Davis put it like this in his book, What Methodists Believe. Methodism sees itself as giving a special emphasis to certain elements in the understanding and practice of the Christian faith, without denying their presence in other churches. So in the remainder of this lecture this morning, I want to briefly introduce three of these elements, more time given to the first. Believing them to be, and I've coined this phrase this morning, believing them to be really good good news for today. Not only for Wesleyanism and Methodism, or even merely Christianity, if Christianity can ever be merely, but also for a world such as we live in today, with all its potential, wonder, plurality, bewilderment, integration, migration, inequalities, prejudices, hatreds, and self-destructive tendencies. I believe that these three, and I've just chosen three, Methodist emphasis are not only crucially required by the human race today, but are inherently mission potent and therefore healthy evangelism. And they're also, incidentally, themes that deeply move me and continue to inspire and challenge my own Christian discipleship. Well, what are they? The first such emphatic theme of Methodism is our emphasis on provenient grace and the way in which it is expressed and applied, which I regard as really good, good news. And I put it like that because actually, and it's a sobering fact to us all, not everything we think is good news is received as good news by very many people today. Now, as many of us know, provenient grace is often and normally discussed in the context of God's entire graciousness, which we Methodists and Wesleyans delineate in terms of provenient saving and sanctifying grace. And I know a number of people who have chosen to become Christians in the Methodist tradition because of that emphasis on provenient grace. That's not surprising because the conviction that divine grace comes before, become, comes prior to any conscious awareness of God is a winsome and wonderful good news theme. 
As John's Gospel puts it, the true light that enlightens everyone was coming into the world. Provenient grace, you see, affirms that God's offer comes before God's demands, that God always asks first and then invites a response. Our emphasis on provenient grace is closely connected to other healthy convictions and emphases of Methodism. For example, a profound conviction about the universal scope of Christ's atoning death. Let me say that again because it's a technical sentence. Particularly, a conviction about the universal scope of Christ's atoning death. The belief that Jesus died for all and everyone and that all and everything benefits from that death. When I was undertaking my doctoral studies in the 1980s, I found that this belief in the universal scope of Christ's atoning death was a key reason why stoutly evangelical Methodism in all its forms never seriously considered not baptising infants. There were huge pressures, particularly in the 1830s and 40s, for Methodism to abandon what was seen to be a church pro process and, re uh, and uh, replace it with an evangelical process. And they stoutly resisted it. Not because baptism itself was believed to bestow any sort of regenerative or special grace dispensed ex opere operato, but because Christ's death for all meant that there was, quite simply, not a child born to whom it could not be declared by name exactly what we say in our current baptismal orders. Jennifer, John, for you Jesus Christ came into the world, for you he lived and showed God's love, for you he suffered death up on the cross, for you he triumphed over death, rising to newness of life, all this for you before you could know anything of it. We love because God first loved us. As one Cliff College student once said to me, it took me a long time to realize that when I came to believe that Jesus died for me, I wasn't somehow bringing that about by believing it, but recognizing and accepting it was true before ever I believed it. Or, a second example of common and healthy beliefs, uh, emphatic within Methodism, but closely attached to that of provenient grace. Take the key conviction of Methodism that God is quintessentially merciful, loving, and gracious, and so de desires that all, everyone, be saved. 1 Timothy 2, 4. And therefore, makes a way for that to be possible through the self-giving sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Leading not only to the assertion of God's love for us all, but also the subsequent conviction that each person has innate worth and so must be accorded those things that recognize and express that worth, a person for whom Christ died. Respect and dignity, justice and compassion, for example. And also that it is possible for every person not only to be saved and renewed, but also to walk and grow in God's sanctifying grace towards a holiness of life, a life of perfecting love, as Wesley would refer to it. These emphases, by the way, are almost certainly one reason why Methodists tend to punch above their weight in terms of contributing to interreligious and interfaith dialogue, theology and practice, and they must continue to do so. I recall a conversation with an American Baptist preacher one year at Easter People. Graham's walked in and he was sat next to me when we had this conversation. The preacher had uh, delivered a fine sermon earlier in the week and I'd done my best earlier that evening and we were now sat in the hotel lounge chatting. Suddenly, apropos of nothing, he said, you Methodists really want people to go to heaven, don't you? And I was completely thrown and I heard myself garble something back like, well, yeah, 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 we do. Don't all Christians? 
And he paused, then sighed and said, well, I guess so. But I sometimes think my church spends more time telling folks what it'd be like in hell than trying to get them into heaven. And in terms of the tones of convictions and emphases that I'm referring to this morning, there's a world of difference between those two aspirations. Or again, I remember Donald English, a great friend and supporter of this college, himself preaching at Easter people some months after his beloved wife, Bertha, had died. And not actually very long before he himself sadly passed away. He told us that night that he'd been asked by Rob Frost, the founder of Easter People, to preach on the theme, Be Good, using a somewhat obscure passage in the Torah. And with a twinkle in his eye, he told us that he always did what Rob Frost asked him to do. And he then spoke movingly and emotionally about his life and ministry, about this occasion and that, and how through it all, even through the stark bereavement he was so evidently experiencing at that time, God had gently, graciously and constantly led and accompanied him. Then, just when we could have thought that he'd abandoned the given theme for a time of personal testimony and decided to disobey dear Rob, he said this, So you see, the key question is not, will you be good? But rather, given that God is a God like this, why wouldn't you choose to be good? It was a very Methodist sermon. But for missiologists especially, the Methodist emphasis on God's provenient grace is closely connected to yet another theme regarding a key role and purpose of the Holy Spirit of God, and it's to that that I turn briefly now. Living two centuries after the first continental reformers, the Wesleys and Methodists coming after them began to preach about the Holy Spirit in terms of developed actions, roles and purposes. Like all Protestants, and incidentally Catholics, they readily agreed that the Holy Spirit enabled believers to bear witness to Christ and was instrumental in Christian initiation. But whereas the early reformers, faced with real and active opposition and conflict, understandably focused on the Holy Spirit as comforter and strengthener and protector of fragile communities of reformed faith. Wesleyans, in addition to that, tended to emphasise the Holy Spirit's role in enabling an inner witness in the believer that they are indeed children of God, Romans 8. It was, if you like, an Arminian assertion about assurance of salvation in the context of a largely Calvinist Reformation. Leaping forward in time to the later 20th century, some Methodists participated in the renewal of the Holy Spirit as the giver of charismatic gifts and graces, a renewal in which this college particularly but not only through the leadership of Dr Bill Davis, took a significant role. The Methodist Youth Fellowship in which I first came to faith and grew in faith exercised the gifts of the Spirit as normal, ordinary Christianity. And it was only when I went to theological college that I quickly realised that all Methodist student ministers were not actually charismatics. In both emphases, however the reformers and the renewalists, we note that the spirit's role was primarily attached to the internal life of the church, of its sacraments, its ministries, its protection, the interior life of the believer, and so on. It's significant, therefore, that Methodists, not only but most certainly, have been at the vanguard of talking and writing about the missionary nature of the Holy Spirit. The missionary nature of the Holy Spirit. For example, uh, Mortimer Arias, Kenneth Cracknell, Raymond Fung, Donald Messer, Elaine Heath, Michael Wilde, Kenneth Carter, to quickly name but a few. 
This has produced what I loosely term Methodist belief in a big Holy Spirit, with apologies to pure theologians everywhere. The third person of the Holy Trinity more involved in the world than the church, more concerned with global goodness and restoration of us all and everything, rather than simply personal charismata and renewal. These convictions of Methodists create deep, almost instinctive emphases for us that the Holy Spirit is working in the heart of every human being and is abroad throughout the world, wooing, loving, challenging, enabling, renewing, revealing Christ and being about the things of God's kingdom reign. The Holy Spirit is not only the go-between God, to quote a title of a very famous book when I was training in the ministry in 1846, but it's also the going before God. The Acts of the Apostles, or more accurately, the Acts of the Holy Spirit, give ample evidence of the Holy Spirit understood in this way. Going preveniently into the world, always ahead of a nascent Christian movement, itself commanded outwards. Altering the implied image of God, the parent, pushing the church out of the door into a dark and challenging world with the words of the Great Commission ringing in their ears and then shutting the door behind them. Changing that picture and that assumption into an image of God the parent opening the door into a challenging, exciting, wonderful, if needy world and turning to the Church of Christ and saying, follow me. Many a Cliff College student down the years has learned the truth of this. I remember groups of students gathering in this very chapel for prayer and a last-minute pep talk before setting off on mission to a church or circuit. What are you going to be doing, I'd ask, to which someone would always reply something like, we're going to take Jesus to the people there. So off they went and then returned, gathering again for another debrief. You said you were going to take Jesus to the folk there, I'd say. What happened? And the response was always the same. He was already there. You can't believe it, but some even sounded quite put out and miffed at this revelation. <laughs> so what have you been doing for the past two weeks, I'd say? Well, we saw what God was doing and we just joined in. These aspects of an emphatic belief in God's provenient grace impact and shape how Methodists view the world and all its inhabitants. My dear college principal Dick Jones summarised the doctrine of human nature like this. Never, he said, be surprised at the evil and awful things humans are capable of and never be surprised at the truly good and wonderful things human beings are capable of. Wesleyans most certainly do not regard the world as anything but fallen. We are not naive about evil or the nature of humanity. But we also hold to the conviction that the world is most certainly impregnated with divine presence and therefore ultimate hope. So Methodists are rarely drawn to theologies of a distant, disinterested, dispassionate God, absent watchmakers and so on. Rather, they instinctively adopt a high view of incarnation, of presence, of participation and example. And in consequence, we have what I have called a decidedly dirty fingernail kind of spirituality. This, in turn, inevitably impacts and shapes how Methodists engage with the world, its people, its species, its ecology. For example, the provenient work of the Holy Spirit of Mission surely shapes and steers our evangelism and the content and the tones of it, rather than to any move to abolish evangelism, which so many are moving to. 
particularly at a time when our assumptions of what worked in the past are considered by larger numbers of people as increasingly naive, insensitive and counterproductive. Similarly, the type and tone of our Christian service and servanthood and how it's dispensed to others is affected by this lurking but wonderful doctrine of provenience. So, to conclude the first and main theme about God's provenient grace, these convictions about it, these perfectly orthodox Methodist emphases about God, about salvation, about people, about life and how you live it, about the ability to choose the good, about ministry and mission, its moods and tones, are all proper, healthy, respectful Christian witness today. In short, I think they're really good, good news. The second emphatic theme of Methodism on which I want to focus uh, today is our commitment to what John Wesley termed a Catholic spirit and the ways in which it's expressed and applied, which I also regard as really good, good news for today. Wesley's spirit, uh, sermon, Catholic spirit, is found in all of the various standard collections of his sermons right down to today. And the marks of Methodism noted earlier, in terms of both content and tone, run through that sermon like a river through a valley. In essence, this sermon describes the love and goodwill that Christians should have towards one another, and the biblical and theological reasons for why that must be the case. The text for the sermon is found in a somewhat obscure passage in 2 Kings 10, when Jehu, whom Elijah has earlier anointed as the true king of Israel, meets Jehonadab, a tribal leader assisting with the removal of the cult of Baal, often associated with Ahab and Jezebel. And he says to him, is your heart as true to mine as mine is to yours? To which Jehonadab answers, it is. And Jehu says, if it is, give me your hand. So he gives him his hand. Verse 15 from the NRSV. Now, great care must be taken when trying to interpret and apply this sermon. It's used by some, including presently, members in a fracturing worldwide family of Methodists and Wesleyans, to argue in the words of the Beatles, all you need is love, and that beliefs are simply unimportant. That laissez-faire faith is fab. I just can't resist alliterations. But any serious reading of this sermon won't permit that view. What, for example, does it mean to have a heart right with my heart? To which John Wesley suggests in the sermon, it means, is your heart right with God? Do we love God with our heart, our mind, our soul and strength? And has this love cast out our love of the world as a first love? Have we submitted ourselves to the righteousness of God coming through faith in Jesus Christ? Is our heart right towards our neighbours? Do we love all mankind, humankind as ourselves? And is our love shown through our works and lives? Dot, dot, dot. If so, give me your hand. On the other hand, we can easily become more prescriptive than Wesley himself permits. Because in this sermon, like the character of a Methodist tract, he's at pains to make clear that he does not mean, give me your hand if you hold the same opinions and beliefs as me. He's not saying, give me your hand if you'll join my church because it's the one true proper church. He is not saying, give me your hand as long as you worship exactly like I do. Instead, he's saying to his readers, love one another with a 1 Corinthians 13 type love that is patient and kind and humble. He is saying, pray for each other, commending them to God. And he is saying, urge others to love not simply in words, 
but also in deeds and good works. If that's you, dot, 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 then give me your hand. Near the end of the sermon, Wesley helpfully summarises for us, he writes this. But while he, uh, that is the one possessing Catholic spirit, but while he is steadily fixed in his religious principles in what he believes to be the truth as it is in Jesus, while he firmly adheres to that worship of God which he judges to be the most acceptable in his sight, and while he is united by the most tender and close ties to one particular congregation, his heart is enlarged toward all mankind those he knows and those he does not. He embraces with strong and cordial affection both neighbours and friends, enemies and strangers. This is Catholic or universal love. And he that has this is of a Catholic spirit. For love alone gives the title to this character. Catholic love is a Catholic spirit. All of which gives new substance, new emphasis to famous quotes like, I regard the whole world as my parish, and the most often quoted sentence from this sermon, though we cannot think alike, may we not love alike, indeed we may. Missiologists and others, not least ecumenists, have, while being sensitive to the text of what is, after all, an 18th century sermon, point out its mission potency for today, its healthiness, its worthiness, and the sheer need for such a Catholic spirit in a world seemingly increasingly intolerant of others, hotly divided, and deeply insistent about numerous opinions, customs, and traditions, all of the kind that Wesley wants to set aside as barriers to a Catholic spirit. If I had to take only eight books about mission and evangelism on my desert island, one of them would surely be Don Messer's book, A Conspiracy of Goodness, Contemporary Images of Christian Mission. First published in 1992, it remains for me one of the most prophetic books on mission ever written, and written by a United Methodist. The contemporary images of mission that Messer lays out are evocative and inspiring, providing challenging new metaphors of church and its mission and ministry. The Christian church, he contends in the book, is to be a covenant of global gardeners. A covenant of global gardeners. And it's intriguing to note that the great David Bosch almost entirely omitted any reference to ecological issues in his magnificent transforming mission, incidentally published within two months of when Messer published his own book. A covenant of global gardeners and the church is to become a collegiality of bridge builders. A company of star throwers, those who provide lights, shafts of light like stars in a darkening world. And a community of fence movers. All of which, he says, combine to suggest that the mission of the church is to participate in a divine conspiracy of goodness, his version of a missio dei approach to mission. God and the church of Christ conspiring, that is, breathing together, working together with the missionary spirit of God for God's kingdom reign on earth as it is in heaven. Each of these evocative images is laden with Catholic spirit, a Wesley sermon to which Messer himself reverentially refers and recognises. The Catholic spirit encourages and supports what missiologists, including Methodists, have asserted in recent decades, that the church is not of itself ultimately of primary importance. And that to realise this is less a heresy and is more about liberation. This assertion, like the emphasis on God's provenient grace, has implications and attached themes. For example, 
the assertion that discipleship of Christ cannot be lived out simply through life within the church congregation, but always goes beyond it, and so wonderfully, but as a byproduct rather than an ultimate intention, results in the renewal of the church. Those trying to keep their lives, but in fact losing them and all that. Rather, those of a Catholic spirit seek first the kingdom of God. They work for it, aiming always to bring more of heaven on earth. And that, in today's complex world, means building partnerships that go beyond partisanship. It means encouraging and supporting anything and everyone whose words and actions take us towards rather than away from the things of God's kingdom reign. It means being committed to seeking the common good together with others. It means not always thinking we Christians must be in charge or always ensuring that we are in charge before we'll happily participate. It means standing with those unjustly treated and speaking for those who have no one to speak for them. It means exercising humility about faith convictions. It means respecting and valuing others and their beliefs without necessarily departing or betraying your own. It means leaving contentedly, living contentedly in both society and community with other people who are not like you. And it means, crucially, embodying love and truth rather than simply stating it. In much of this, we in the West, with our long history of power and influence, would do well to seek out those moving and marvellous contexts, still thankfully evident in the world, in which people, including Christian people, lead the way in living out the Catholic spirit. Such thinking and living in a world like ours is, I believe, really good, good news for us all. And third and finally, the last emphatic theme of Methodism on which I focus today is the inescapable aspect of offering Christ to all. The inescapable aspect of offering Christ to all. Which both creates and arises from Methodism's decidedly missional and evangelistic ecclesiology. You see, it's the same John Wesley who writes about the marks of a true Methodist in terms of character rather than primarily dogma, and who preaches the Catholic spirit as a hope for the world, who also spends his life offering Christ to all in word and deed. As Arthur Skevington Wood, another former principal of this college, put it in his book, The Burning Heart, John Wesley, Dash, Evangelist. Wesley was consistently clear that the key purpose of building a connection of societies was not to form another denominational church. This is not an anti-church statement. Rather, it is to recognise that from the beginning, Wesley regards his proliferating societies and connection primarily in terms of healthy environments in which growth in Christian discipleship and holiness, the marks of true Methodists, come about quite naturally. And this unquestionably and necessarily involves offering Christ to all, through word, deed, invitation, encouragement, challenge, friendship, transformation, Christian service, sacrifice, and Christian love. This does not mean that Methodism undoubtedly becoming a denominational church is an error or a catastrophe. But it does mean that in order to be most true to itself, to the charisms of its founders, to the key perceived reasons why God brought the people called Methodists into existence at all, Methodism must even today retain a profound understanding of itself as an offering Christ community, an evangelistic and missional movement. Else, I believe, that it loses some of its best self at a profound level. Offering Christ to all 
is a definitive aspect of being Methodists, which shaped by emphases like provenient grace and Catholic spirit is, I believe, really good, good news for the world today and therefore Christ's church today. Consequently, offering Christ in word and deed should never be abandoned by Methodism, whether in terms of conviction, intent, allocation of resources, practice, organisation or experimentation. I believe the reason God raised up the people called Methodists in the first place is more about offering Christ in word and deed than primarily debates about the articles of religion or the level of autonomy of a local church congregation or debates about who are the right subjects for baptism or whether baptism in the Holy Spirit is compulsory or discretionary. I say all this in a Catholic spirit, not to claim any superiority for Wesleyanism or Methodism over other Christian groupings or traditions, simply to indicate that the Holy Spirit of mission has a tendency to keep reminding us of our primary purposes under God. And for Methodists, that is to accompany and partner her in offering Christ to all in all sorts of manners and ways. This was what I had in mind when some years ago I employed the phrase Methodism, a discipleship movement shaped for mission, a strap line appreciated by some and not so much by others. To be sure, some appropriate authentic ways of offering Christ today are quite different to those of Wesley's day. A faith rooted in an incarnation as Christianity is can never be impervious to its contexts whether macro or micro. So we must find the best ways of offering Christ in global and local contexts, many significantly altered from the time of our faithful Methodist founders. That's the challenge before the Methodist movement today. And it's an exciting challenge. Such thinking and living in a world like ours is, I believe, really good, good news. I must end. Though we might not immediately recognise it or associate the aspects of Wesleyan Christian emphases that I have focused on today as belonging together, the key common link between them is that they constitute a call for profound and lasting conversion. They call for a deep transformative change and turnaround encapsulated in the New Testament Koine Greek word metanoia. The marks of a true Methodist, the character of Methodism, the emphasis of holiness, of love of God and all people and things, an openness to the missionary spirit of God and joining with her of adopting a Catholic spirit, of offering Christ in word and deed, humility and service, of being a faith tradition turned outwards in mission to all, in all manner of ways, is a real call to conversion today and is profoundly Christian and Wesleyan. It's also profoundly incarnational and human because treasures are found first in common clay pots called people, even if the people must become communities and movements for change for good with all who share their aims. Many years ago, I attended the funeral service of a long-time Methodist mission partner. He had served many years in Eastern Africa and some representatives of the Maasai among whom he'd worked attended his funeral. One woman, resplendent in magnificent tribal dress, paid tribute to him. He was known, she said, by everyone in the area, whether Christian or not, as Mr. Jesus Christ, man. The character, the marks of a Methodist, reminding us again, if we needed reminding, that offering Christ is always less about being salespeople of a religious franchise called Christianity and more about being embodied free gifts and samples of God's love in Christ. 
in a time much characterised by decline and the tiring, dispiriting effects of it. I believe that Methodism remains a Christian faith tradition with emphases and deep convictions that are and remain really good, good news for the world today. I commend these emphases and the best tones in which they might be spoken to be on our lips and shape our lives individually and as a church as we continue to love God, honour Christ and walk with the Holy Spirit in faith, hope, service and joy. Thank you. I want to start by saying an enormous thank you to Martin for a really very insightful and an encouraging lecture. A true reminder to the Methodist people of their distinctive roots and the charisms that give them potential for mission now and into the future. It's a great privilege to be invited to respond to what you have shared with us. Um, I think the purpose of this 10 minutes or so is to allow for time for everybody to be thinking about your response what questions or comments you might like to contribute for the time afterwards in discussion. For me to, to shape that a little bit and to give but really just my own personal reflections. So what I'm saying is feel free to, to, to meditate quietly if you want to ignore what I'm saying, as long as you're thinking about what Martin has said. As a, a Methodist and indeed an ordained minister in the Methodist Church, I very much share Martin's convictions about these themes that he's introduced to us. And I know that whilst not all of us are from within Methodism, here or on, online, as I speak, I think I will be saying we and our and us quite a lot. So I wanted to say at the outset, that's what I'm doing. The first thing that I want to do is just to ask some questions about the claim that we're making for these these emphasis, emphases within Methodism. I notice that the, mar the title Martin has given to the lecture doesn't use the word potential as I did when I made my very opening remarks, but uses the word potency, potency which really struck me. It's a word in its English, English usage usually that I think conveys more of an active, an activated sort of energy and dynamism than just the word potential, which gives that more of a sense of of a, a possible outcome that may or may not be realised. The way you've described the interaction of these three themes, prevenient grace, the Catholic spirit, and offering Christ, suggests more than just potential that good might come from them. Instead, I think you're suggesting that if these three elements are present in Methodism, then the good, good news of Jesus will proceed with power. To be, to be... Well, at that point in my thinking, I, I paused. To be what? And I think if we're going to claim this mission potency within Methodism, we need to think what that actually is. Perhaps it could be potency to be proclaimed. Or perhaps to be shared, which entails not just proclamation, but relationship with another. And then we could go further. To be received, and indeed then to be effective, and there's a whole range of ways we might consider what effective mission is. So I think there's a question there about how we evaluate the effectiveness of mission and what does it mean to say that there's mission potency. If the mission of the church is to proclaim the gospel, then that can be realised at the same time that, as the church itself is under pressure and in even declining. So a question about what mission potency means, and what type of claim we're making. To take that at a different perspective, another level, I wonder if, in fact, we might be able to make any sort of causal claim here. And I think that there's elements of that claim within the lecture Martin's presented for us, that, that if these distinctive theological expressions um, are there, potency is realised. And if we instead observe an under-realisation of mission potency, perhaps it's an indication that those distinctive theological expressions have been shifted or neglected. I think it's an interesting consideration as to whether we can make that kind of claim. 
I suspect that, of course, there are Methodist churches where one might find these three distinctive emphases being expressed and embodied, but church activity and mission effectiveness is struggling, is declining. And on the flip side, I suspect there's going to be Methodist churches where you might not find one or other of these emphases where mission potency is going very well and being realised. So I want to ask and just invite you to think, what kind of claim are we making here? and What does it mean for us? If I turn now to the, the three key emphases that, that Martin has offered to us, I want to say something about each one, though, as he did, spend most time with provenient grace. I had a mixed response to this part of the lecture. Theologically, I completely agree with what Martin has shared with us and feel so much in tune with that way of thinking about God's grace. But I also felt concern how the practices flowing from this strongly affirmed theology of provenient grace might work out practically. So one concern as I was listening to the first part of the lecture I had was that how does this fit with the call to evangelism, to make disciples? Now to some extent, and I think, well largely, Martin's third emphasis of offering Christ steps into that possible gap that's left if prevenient grace is on its own in our thinking. And I appreciated the way you did that and indicated that combination coming at the end of the first section. I think though that relationship does demand further reflection and attention. The early Methodists, particularly John Wesley, saw dangers in a spirituality that was primarily informed by a theology centred on the sovereign judgment of God, often characterised in the 18th century as Calvinist. But there are also dangers in a spirituality which is primarily informed by a theology of the prevenient loving grace of God. An overemphasis on prevenient grace without appropriate recognition of the sinfulness of human choices and human institutions and the accompanying call to offer Christ as the only way to fullness of life can leave us with something of a diluted and uninspiring gospel. It might be a, a, a gospel proclamation that could be characterised as something like this, saying to the world and to the people around us, well, you're all okay. God is at work in your lives. Regardless of the situation you're in, regardless of your lifestyle choices, regardless of the deeply challenging state of the world around you, don't worry. It's all good because God is to be found in it all somewhere going ahead. There's no need to do anything different. It's clear that that misses out the gospel call to repentance and to true transformation. There's another danger with a spirituality, though, focused on prevenient grace. And the logic of that works out like this. We can go forward thinking, well, God is out there doing what God will do. Good. And yet, when we look at the world, we see such despair, such difficulty. It's evident that more is needed. And so we come to the conclusion, God needs us to go and get involved with this activity that God is doing. God needs us. In a positive frame, it's what's sometimes called in Methodism an activist spirituality. But it can so easily become overly focused on human activity, on a human way of seeing mission. I was challenged in this many years ago when I had a, a personal mentor for a time who was formed in a more reformed theological tradition. She observed my tendency to always be busy and active and going on to the next thing and commented, that's the trouble with you Arminians. You always think it's down to you alone to fix the world, as if God was not really God and as if God cannot be trusted to do anything without you. <coughs> it's interesting to see ourselves from someone else's perspective. Now, of course, all that begs the question of what is our doctrine of God? And Martin alluded to this when he was rejecting a view of God as disinterested and dispassionate. Perhaps we need to go even further and hear the critique from the other end of the spectrum, from process theologians, that any view of God as almighty and unchanging and sovereign can create problems for us. Potentially problems that are contradictory with our own very experience and end up with a theology that doesn't 
allow us to account well for the active, loving mission practices that are instinctive to most Methodist people. How does that sit with our theology? What theological work is needed to keep making sense of what I think is quite rightly, as Martin described it, a dirty fingernail spirituality? I think Martin was very wise to bring the Holy Spirit then into the discussion of provenient grace. I'm interested in the way that he introduced this and the fact that it is truly a development from the early Methodism and indeed fairly recent development in Methodism, comparatively. The significant emphasis on prevenient grace is already a development from Wesley and the early Methodists, who, yes, had that within their theology, but it wasn't forefronted, foregrounded in the way that we might do now. And to bring the Holy Spirit to the centre is a further departure from those early origins. There was recognisable, charismatic-style experiences in the 18th century, but the Holy Spirit played much less of a developed role in the theology and practice of the revival than in the 20th century and now, influenced so much by the Pentecostal and charismatic movements. Donald Dayton, in his groundbreaking historical survey of the theology, theological connections between Methodism and the Pentecostal movement, who pointed out that even when thinking about the Holy Spirit, Wesley remains in a firmly Christocentric framework. Dayton points to Sangster's study of Wesley's restorationist theology, which is fascinating. He identifies across Wesley's works 30 key scriptural texts that Wesley draws on again and again to talk about restoration and renewal. And not a single one of those texts is from the Book of Acts, which from a contemporary theological perspective is very surprising. So our theology of the Holy Spirit has changed quite radically. I think Martin is right to say that it is at the heart of Methodist missiological thinking. We need to recognise, though, that it is a, a transformation, a change, and there's a discussion to be had about how we claim that as a Methodist distinctive, especially alongside its ongoing development ecumenically in the world. Let's turn to the second key emphasis. The Catholic spirit. I thought the lecture dealt so wonderfully, helpfully well with this theme. Uh, Martin was really upfront and helpful in addressing potential misinterpretations of that Wesley sermon. I really appreciated the, the, the warning that we need to be careful of the Beatles spirituality of saying all you need is love. And you'll perhaps realise I see that also with provenient grace from the comments I just made. I really appreciated the way that the Catholic spirit was applied missiologically. That it's not just about inter-Christian relations, but it is part of our offer of Christ and of the gospel to others. That chimes so much with my own experience. In my years of ordained ministry in the Methodist Church, I have always, in one way or another, been involved with the life of ecumenical congregations. And we have always found that that, that effort and challenge to work together as Christians becomes part of our proclamation of the gospel, becomes part of our witness and our offer to the wider community. Come join us in this good news of reconciliation. Thank you to Martin for introducing the work of Messer, which I did not know and will be going to enjoy in the future. The third theme was offering Christ. And the lecture ends with that third emphasis in a way that really helpfully and subtly intertwines with that, that offering Christ, with prevenient grace, and with the Catholic spirit. There's always a danger that offering Christ is somehow set up in opposition to other aspects of Methodist spirituality and theology that are less forefront evangelistic practices. But of course, they can only work well and properly if held together. Martin gave us a list of a number of potentially divisive issues which are less important than the centre imperative to offer Christ. I wonder if, though, we also need to recognise the diversity within Methodism as to what offering Christ might actually constitute in practice. And we might need to go even further and acknowledge that there may even be a widespread confusion or even a difficulty giving any answer to what it might mean to offer Christ in our contemporary situation. Martin poses this as a key practice for Methodism and as a key challenge. How do we offer Christ now in the places and with the people whom we live? I would argue that, that we should go further. More than just a challenge, 
it's actually at the heart of what the Methodist movement is about itself. We need to be very wary of thinking that there was some other context of a golden era when we had a settled and secure sense of what offering Christ looked and felt like, but that now we lament that we've lost that confidence. In fact, what we're presented with is a remarkable set of new opportunities with each new context that we go into where we're called to discover what offering Christ means, to learn and listen from what God is, about what God is doing with those new people we're meeting, and so to be enabled to embody the offering of Christ in new ways ourselves. Keeping on asking those questions about how Christ can be offered in new contexts is actually, I think, an essential feature of Methodism. Maybe our discussions in a moment might go that way. How do we offer Christ in new contexts? So to conclude, the main thing I want to say is thank you to Martin for, for pushing my thinking about how these three emphases fit together and work together in a Methodist theology and spirituality. And I hope and pray that our collective discussion now might be fruitful and energising. Thank you.